So is it possible that we're all going to get exactly ready to eat fish out of the sea? It's impossible. No, the, the, ready to eat? Tons, no, no. <laughs> there's right. going to be tons of work to do. That's no right. matter what the net catches, you're going to have to clean the fish. You're going to have to prepare it. You're going to have to. Mm. So obviously, I think it's a totally. I mean, if there are priests out there who are saying, look, uh, hey, great. We're bringing all these people to church. But can we can we like disqualify a few fish and throw them back into the sea? I I think that's problematic. It's, it's just not. That's not the orthodox way, right? We're we're gonna be sure, sure it's gonna be hard, but it's it's a it's that's the whole point. Why are we why are we priests, right? Yeah, this yeah. Let's be grateful for the catch. Well, welcome to Royal Pass. Uh, I am your host, Andrew, and it is an extreme honor to have with us tonight, Father Peter Hears, and I'm going to ask, Father, I don't know if you're familiar with the format of our show, but I usually start the show with like a little icebreaker just to kind of get the conversation going a little bit. So I'm going to ask you three, what is your favorite like overtly religious movie? Like the movie that's like overtly Christian, you know, like it's like not even making any qualms like your prince of egypt's your passion of the Christ, uh, the passion of the christ and stuff like that mm. i know mine for sure cyprian what's up the the island ostrov i used to love mine movie oh it's, it's so good i figured it would be more than one of ours yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i think it's got to be the best one of the best yeah, it's so good yeah, yeah. what about you father yeah. turbo do you got you got or has it got to be the island uh can i give like a tie Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, I really love Rube Love. Mm. It's, I, I love that movie. Um, Which one? I didn't hear. Which one? Uh, Rube Love. I was going to say that was the next one. <laughs> yeah. I love, I, man, I love that movie so much. I love yeah. that movie so much. I love Rube Love. And this one might, this one might surprise people. Um, I just, forgive me. I know it's tough to hear. But I really like that animated Prince of Egypt. It's good. It's really good. And it's yeah, it's good. I, I really, 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 really like that one for for a lot of reasons. You know, I mean, I love Ben Hur. You know, I love I, I love Ben Hur. I love the original Ten Commandments. But that's something about that that something about that Prince of Egypt movie. I think maybe because I have really fond memories with my kids, and it's associated watching my kids and them you know, asking questions about Moses and I don't know, it's just, it's, it, it brings, it brings a story to life and, in, in a really joyful kind of way. So I really like that movie. I like the portrayal of the plagues. I think that the way yeah. that they took, they, they conquered or they tackled the plagues is really cool. Well, I'm going to be lame and say that probably behind the Island, of course, cause I think that is the top, but is fireproof. Is that uh, Kurt Cameron movie? Is that Kurt Cameron? Oh, never, I've never seen it. <laughs> it is supremely good. My baptizing priest gave me that and the mission, which is an also a supremely good one. And I was like, ugh, Kurt Cameron, whatever. And then I watched it, and it's extremely powerful. I've talked about it on this very podcast before. About... He's a fireman, right? Yeah. He's a you, fireman, and there's this yeah. whole scene where he like falls through the floor, and he's stuck underneath a burning house, and he's like crying out to God and screaming for help and stuff like that. It's like it's he's like just like God help me, I need help, and it's like the way he does it, and the reconciliation between spoiler the reconciliation between the husband and the wife is done really really well, and it's cheesy and it's super western, but it's it gets me, it gets mm -hmm. me, it's uh. Yeah, if we're going to move out of the orthodox realm and get into like old, old, you know, non-orthodox styles movies, then I think we got to commemorate, like you said, the mission. And one of oh, my man. favorites, one of my favorites is a really cheesy one, but I think it's great. Is it's a Wonderful Life. Yeah, 
I'm yeah. just a, I'm a sucker for never seen it life every year. But, but you know, seen Father, it's a wonderful life. You I never have. seen that, Andrew? Oh, come on. Uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's insane. <laughs> my wife just watched it for the first time like a year ago. And she's like, this is like the greatest movie ever made. And so like I I just haven't sat down and watched it yet. So it's pretty good. Yeah. If, if 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 there was an orthodox like producer or director behind it, it would have been like ten times better. But it's still great for what <laughs> yeah. for what it was. It still sure. has a lot of really good things. Sure. And then I want to tell you the the most important documentary that will be made. How's that sound? Can I throw that in there? Just mm. throw it out there. Is, is this a free for all? I feel like I feel like I'm just jumping in and maybe I'm ruining free the for all. no. Do it. It's a free for all. Go ahead. <laughs> so I you, have you seen what is a woman? Yes. Yes. Father, oh, you yeah. see what is a woman? Oh yeah, loved it. Okay, I think I told you this, didn't I, Father? When you're here, I want to make what is a Christian. That's what, that's a goal I have. What is a Christian based on based on what is a woman is kind of a structure for what we would do. Mm. But I think the reason why we're asking the question of what is a woman is because we don't know the question, the answer to what is a Christian. It's directly 100 B line from the Reformation to today. It's all connected. And so ultimately, because we don't have the identity of who Christ is, we don't have the identity of who we are. Mm. And then we end up even questioning what a woman is or a man is. So we've got to eventually get to the point where people are talking about what is a Christian, because we need to redefine that in the minds of the vast majority of people in the Western world. Well, forgive me, Father. I think like like we were talking the other night, I think it's a great idea. And it kind of really jumps into, you know, what I what it came to me later. I was like, I really want to talk about missions. Yes. Because yes. there's, so, I mean, missions for, forgive me, missions in regards to the Orthodox world, and let's say stateside, because um, I, I don't know, but you'll be able to talk about in Greece and other places, Father, you're, you're well more traveled and you know more circles, but I know stateside, it's just a small sector of us that seemingly talk about missions. It's just a small sector that, you know, maybe you'll have a few people in each jurisdiction that, you know, are on a really small board or maybe a small um ministry you know oh i run the you know uh, evangelism and missions you know for xy jurisdiction small contingency of a larger jurisdiction or you have organizations like o ocmc or iocc but they'll talk about missions but even then there's such a small segment and i just think missions is so important and it's so broad because it, from my perspective, it spans everything from prison ministry to housing ministry to campus ministry. Um, there's there's missions in regards of you know even trying to evangelize the faithful, right? I mean that's that's another way of seeing it. And I, I would just say this, you know, I think one of the biggest things that we're missing for me is, I and forgive me for let me know if you think I'm too far off base, but. It's one of the few things that are keeping the Lord from returning. I mean, this is this is the thing. This is why we're still left here. This is why the church militant is still struggling, because mm -hmm. the sanctification, the 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 purification, the illumination, uh, and then the the theosis that we're called to the the saints that are still struggling, or the future saints are still struggling, but they're still people. The harvest is ripe, and and I just I just think that. Because of we are ignorant of a orthodox missiology, because we're ignorant of a true scriptural understanding of, of the importance um, of being Israel in regards of Israel's job was to bring the, the news of God to the nations. Mm -hmm. uh, and so us being Israel, you know, are we fulfilling that mission? Are we representing God accurately to the world? Um, Your connection between the end of days and the mission of the church is absolutely correct. And there is a reason why, one of the reasons why we don't know the end is because ultimately it's based on the repentance or lack thereof of the world. And first and foremost, the status or the state of the repentance of the Christian, because repentance is not something you do once or twice or five times, but you live a continuous Repentance, and that's apparent in the Greek. The Greek is a continuous present. It doesn't say repent. It says keep on repenting. It's a continuous process and stance. And so, therefore, insofar as Christians are repenting, they are preaching, mm -hmm. and they are making disciples of nations. It's not an accident the Lord began with repent 
for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he sent the disciples to preach repentance and make disciples and baptize. All these things are connected insofar as we have abandoned that. And unfortunately, the vast majority, it seems, I mean, God forgive us, but it does seem quite a bit that the call to repentance is not even heard, let alone the 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 agony to repent mm. and i'm speaking from my experience of 20 years in greece as much as in america you don't hear a dynamic sermon on repentance very often it's not something you know, if you take something like abortion which is very much practiced among orthodox christians unfortunately to our great disgrace in, and of course, in the world generally, because why you don't hear repentance, uh, preaching of repentance for this grave, grave sin, just to give one example. So it's absolutely linked. The degree to which we and you and I and every one of us are continuously repenting and have the stance of repentance is going to determine the the effectiveness of our presence in the world and therefore the 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 weight and the the, the impact of the preaching or the teaching uh, to the world it's all connected and and you know the church has never really been threatened externally like it's not the problem what they they are they meaning the those of this world will do to us as christians is a constant and it's not the problem right the, the persecutions the 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 blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The problem is always internal. Mm. The problem is our apostasy, our secularization, our uh, falling away from the narrow path. That is always the problem. So repentance is a is absolutely has to be the core. Every day we come back again and again and again and again, and we come back. We don't even know what repentance means, Father. What does it mean to repent? It, it, repentance means reorientation. It means yes. return. Yes. It means communion. Yes. If you look yes. at the Greek term for uh, forgiveness, synchorisi, the word means to be in the same place. It means to be in communion, in other words. Mm. So if you are forgiven, if you are, you've, you've returned, you are in communion. Mm. And so, so somebody, somebody said, well, you know, repent. They, most of the time, I think a lot of people in the world, they think repentance means remorse. Right. It means feeling bad. It means uh, being, you know, feeling guilty. That's right. not repentance. That's remorse. And you know that Judas had remorse, but Peter had repentance. Yes. One was saved, the other one was lost. So if we're all just feeling bad about who we are, but we're not returning to the Father, we're not getting up from the pigsty, and we're not constantly in process of returning, and, 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 and he's awaiting our embrace, right? That whole process is a lifelong journey into the embrace of the Father eternally, if that's not who we are, that's not our identity, and unfortunately it's oftentimes not our identity, because we're not formed like that. We're formed, most of the people who grew up in the church are formed, and again, speaking from 20 years in Greece, we're formed to think of orthodoxy as a identity uh, in this world, like our ethnic identity. Like a culture, a cultural identity. Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, I'm Orthodox, I'm Greek Orthodox, I'm from this village. It's like... And it's like, okay, good. It's you have this taftotita, you have this identity. What does it mean? Is it what is it? Where does it? Where is the essence, the heart of this identity for you? It's being somebody. It's a static thing. Right? Mm -hmm. I am Orthodox. Mm -hmm. I, I like this. You know, the famous book "Becoming Orthodox" by Father Peter Gilk, which is a great, great missionary tool for a lot of people. But it's a little bit off. Like becoming Orthodox isn't the process from. When you're a Protestant and you are received into the church, it's it's the whole process from that point to your death, mm. right? It's the it's the whole process of going deeper and repenting. So the uh, you know the, if we do if we do all kinds of missionary activity, which is essential, it's important. Like you said, prison ministry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that's essential. It's good, but if we're not doing it in that stance of repentance, we're not constantly. Uh, getting up and returning every day deeper and deeper into the embrace of the Father, then it's just a, it's just going to be uh, stillborn. It's not going to it's not going to re rejuvenate the world of the church. If I can just say really quick, Father, um, I have like a limited experience. Well, I have experience with that. It's not Orthodox, but I work with a Christian ministry, 
but it, it there is no call to repentance it's this you're fine the way you are and there's there's housing ministry there's prison ministry but it is it's largely ineffective and at best at best it deals with the externals of the problem while not addressing anything in her like there why do you think no that is what would you say the cause of that is what are they missing so in my personal opinion i think it's a financial standpoint i think that they need to keep the message very pc i think that they need because they're not getting money to preach christ they're getting money to preach uh Oh, uh, soothing, pacification, the ability to keep someone calm, the ability to like, but it's like I've said, it's bringing people, I've said on this podcast before, it's bringing people back to zero and that's it. And then they just kind of go back down the same path again. And then they're called back to zero to kind of calm. And I think it's just not in the nature of the Western Protestant Christian mindset to look for repentance it's very much a get out of jail free card it's very much a i can do what i want within reason and god still got me and christ is still if got they me. were to say no we're going to be about repentance would they even know i mean what would they what would that mean like guilt, you're... most likely they would view it as guilt remorse mm -hmm. there would be no changing of the energy there would be no uh, uh in place of anger seeking calm you know there would be no like I've taken now it's time to give there would be they, they would not act as Zacchaeus did like they uh yeah Zacchaeus yeah Zacchaeus he, yeah, mm -hmm. Zacchaeus, yeah. turning fourfold yeah exactly there would yeah. be a a place of it's very moralistic that's what I feel comfortable no, saying. that's the that's the same nature we were going to talk a little bit uh earlier we we're talking about maybe we need to talk about things like the things that are are threatening the church's uh unity and depth and identity like you know the various isms and masonry and all this stuff but it's all connected actually because if if we I mean, the whole spirit of ecumenism is the is the blurring of the boundaries right so there's no more identity left we don't know where we're returning to so you can't talk about repentance if you don't know where you're returning to. Where are you reorienting mm -hmm. to? To who are you reorienting? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean, right? So it's all connected. The reason why people aren't repenting or don't know how to repent is because ultimately they've lost what it means to be oriented to Christ. They've lost the identity of Christ. Because the blur and, and the boundaries, when they're blurred, and we say, well, the church is partially present everywhere, like Vatican II or whatever— all of that has to do with the blurring of the image of Christ, ultimately, right? It's the it's the it's the doing away with the identity of Christ. So if that's done, if you if you have a basically an image of Christ which is very blurry, then there can be no repentance. Ultimately, it's it's cutting off the path of repentance. You know, Father, it's interesting because um, before the providence, you know, the of meeting you and getting able to get this connected for tonight. I was saying we should maybe talk about a question that someone had sent uh, to us about um, I, I've talked and we've, we've talked about some, this on the show quite a bit in regards of, you know, racial issues and reconciliation, all these things. And and um, I think this is a great example because I've said to people, you know, um, the problem is there's no sense of repentance. So what happened with BLM? And all of this um, political correct madness that's come, it comes in it, and it it comes in this anti. It's very antichrist in the sense that it's not coming in, in repentance. So what it's fomented is greater confusion, greater resentment, greater division, mm. because all it's done is try to get to appease people. Very much like with addiction or everything else, is trying to just appease people's uh, desire for vengeance. Mm. Or appease, you know, for instance, like maybe in quote unquote white guilt, appease people's sense of guilt, but not give them a place of repentance. And so that's poison. That type of guilt is poison. It doesn't feed anything. In fact, it, it kills. And, you know, I was in, in, in answering that, you know, I would say this is one of the biggest problems that we have. And please forgive me. I just want to digress on something because, um, you know, I have... Uh, I go to a chiropractor, you know, and one of the things that I've, I've learned, you know, um, with a good sober chiropractor is that they'll show you that things are connected. You know, my my hip may be out, but really it's because my neck is out, you know, mm -hmm. so I need to start getting things in line because I think that it's one thing when really it's all connected. 
And yes. part of the problem is that there's things out of balance and out of sync, right? So I think all this is connected because, you know, for instance, um, irregardless of the circumstances, which tend to be generally nefarious behind a lot of these things, it seems like the principalities manifest in such a way that they are looking to provoke people, provoke greater racial tensions, provoke greater class tensions, um, civic unrest based on all these different things of the passions. And people fall for it easily, repetitively, because there's no repentance, because it's never been modeled for America. And I think that's something people don't understand is that when you look at Russia, Russia was able to move forward because they repented of their regicide. They they knew how to repent. They knew how to, because repentance isn't an apology to the other person. David shows us what repentance is. Against you and only you have I sinned, Lord. Mm-hmm. Repentance is always the, the one who has transgressed and sinned in God. And then, forgive me, but and I, I know this is this is part of the problem is that for people who aren't Orthodox, and even for people who have a more superficial Orthodox formation, that sounds unfair. Like, what do you mean, David, you know, just cutting out Uriah like that? David, David did Uriah dirty. It's like, yes, David did do Uriah dirty, but David understood the bigger picture of what it, of what his sin really did. Not just to Uriah, not just to Bathsheba, not just to the nation, but really mankind and God. He he understood that ultimately God had given him everything. And so People don't have this understanding of repentance. They don't have this understanding of not just ceasing the bad behavior, but pursuing virtue and pursuing reconciliation with God first and foremost. And I well, think- in reconciliation, Father, is always, uh, uh, we would say in Greek, it's so much easier in Greek, some of these things to say, uh, stavriki, in other words, the cross. the cross, right? So it's always vertical and horizontal at the same time. Reconciliation is impossible if you're only on one one plane, and so David understood that implicitly that there was it was interconnected between man and God, and when you offend the one, you offend the other, and and this is where again we're lost because even as Orthodox, many Orthodox we become Orthodox, but we remain on the horizontal plane mm-hmm. because we have a relationship mm-hmm. with we don't have a relationship in a immediate, oftentimes immediate way. In other words, we haven't gone deep or we haven't ascended, we're still learning about Christ, about Orthodox, we've become professionals, we've become experts in church history or dogmas or canons or 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 the ideology mm-hmm. of the ideological conflict. People talk about ideology as if it's something that belongs to the church. We, we don't, there's no ideology in the church. Right. We, don't, we don't worship an idea. We don't talk about ideas. We talk about a person, and we experience that person. And so, yeah, I think this is the, this is the, um, in so many ways, we could we could analyze this from just different angles, but it, it really is the heart of the problem: is we're not repenting, but we also don't know how to and who, to whom and how to uh, reorient. In other words, repent and and go back into communion, and that's our job as priests. We have to constantly be mystagogues, mm-hmm. right, initiating the people mm-hmm. into the mystery of repentance and of communion. And it's such a crux of what I think. So many of us lament of the missed opportunities of missions. You know, if, if uh, say, sir, from Sarab, if we acquired that spirit of peace, right, which you can't acquire without repentance, I think that's fair to say. Mm. A thousand rounds you being saved. So many opportunities the last three years, if the church and her leaders, you know, had have had the, the Philotimo, <laughs> you know, to really stand up and, and bear witness I mean, look at how many people have been coming just by content being out there. Can you imagine, can you imagine, Father, can you imagine if there had been more brave clergy and higher? We don't need to do much, Father. We just need to be Orthodox. That's That's all we need to do. And there'll be thousands upon thousands of people banging at our door. So the problem is us. We are, we, we have seen the enemy. <laughs> it's us, <laughs> right? And so we talk about repentance. We need to repent of what happened during COVID. Amen. We need to repent. 
Amen. You see and hear about repent. How could we talk about repentance to the world needs to repent? What, are, what, what if we're not repenting? Yeah. Right. Mm. Well, but if, if we've got to come to our senses first and realize what what we how we've sinned. You know, and take responsibility for our actions. And so we have a problem of orthodoxy ultimately, right? When because if you can't identify the sin and you don't take responsibility for it, you can't repent. Well, you know, Father, it's funny because there's a phenomenon that I've I've observed where um, someone gets that lightning of inspiration. Let's say God gives them the greatest gift that He can give them. He shows them their sin. Hmm. They approach the church. They come in. They are absolutely in awe. Um, they're in love. The honeymoon phase, all the good stuff. They're obedient. They're doing everything they can to come in. They get in, and now they're like, okay, work's done. I'm fine. And really soon what begins to happen is, is people begin to lose not just the momentum, but it almost seems like they begin to lose the vision because they become enamored with their new robes, if you will, you know, people coming in and if you're following me and they, 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 the airs of religiosity mm-hmm. take over and the inner work really, I think not only never gets started, um, but even, you know, to some degree people become blinded to it because they think that they they've arrived. And, um, you know, I've seen this with this, I call it the two year hump where, you know, people are, come into the church, they're two years in, three years in, sometimes five, and then they fall away because after the honeymoon's over, the exoticness of, you know, the quote-unquote eastern part of orthodoxy is gone, you know, all this stuff, and they realize, okay, I, I'm I'm with Christ, um, it's painful, I don't like it, and I have to work. And then slowly, you know, other things become more important. As- Two mm-hmm. priests, now that we, I have a chance to ask this, as two priests, what do you guys do to discourage that or work through that with someone? Like someone maybe stops coming to the liturgy as much, they're not coming to confession anymore. I mean, besides the obvious prayer, is there anything that you 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 uh, you priests do to like help someone through that? I think that one of the things that's missing in a lot of people's lives is inspiration. And, 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 you know, if we can't, um, people have to want to, to, to be with Christ and we can't implant that we can inspire them and, and, and the, and we can present images and examples before them to be inspired. So I talk incessantly about the lives of the saints, uh, because we don't have many saints in our day, in our age, we have a few, but they're, they're not in, in our churches or in our parishes where, we're, the vast majority of us are just babes and beginners. And so it's very hard if you're constantly uh, under a barrage of bad examples. You've got to shut those out of your life. You've got to shut them out and you've got to fill your life with inspiring examples. If you were, you know, imagine we're all like in a, in the, you know, Chicago inner city and we, uh, we were poor and we're uneducated and the one hope we have to get out of this the, the slum is is basketball right mm-hmm. and we want to we want to we want to become like michael jordan and we're mm-hmm. and we're going to imitate him and we're going to spend hours upon hours upon hours on the basketball court because that's really for us at least that's what we think it's the only way to get out of the slum if you didn't if that that young man didn't have an example michael jordan or whoever it is of the day there would be even harder for him to get up in the morning and run to the basketball court and play till he till he drops right so how we're poor we're uneducated we're 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 pathetic right we don't even do prostrations we can barely concentrate on the jesus prayer what are we going to do well we're going to run to the examples and we're going to want to imitate them and put them before us constantly continually have them before us how they lived how they struggled how they repented themselves and how how they loved and all these things. And if you don't do that, it's very natural for you to give up, right? What athlete who doesn't have a coach and doesn't have inspiration is going to continue to go out and beat his beat himself up and eat, you know, crappy food or food that you know is not so tasty and just 
exhaust himself when there's not going to be he has no real hope or desire or or or, or thought that he's going to get the reward he's going to win very the game few. very few he doesn't have a coach like most of our our christians father they don't have coaches yeah you know, we're spiritual fathers that's right that's a huge thing right there if they don't have a spiritual father and he's not there telling them keep going get up run yeah. you know like a good coach would how are they going to make progress and then if he's not saying, you know, let's go, let's go tonight and watch this, see how this he does this and how this person does this, and they examine the examine the plays and they go through the whole motion of what's going to happen on the field. All of that is the same. We're doing the same thing. If you go to church on Sunday and it's this, and you have the same experience and same idea about what that is day in and day out, right? Because you're basically there and superficially examining this great mystery, which is heaven, right? Heaven, you have ascended to heaven at every divine liturgy. But if you don't have somebody to initiate you into that mystery and to show you the way in which you c can participate truly in that mystery and go deeper, because it's eternal, it'll never end. It's going to happen eternally. You're going to go deeper, right? And so there's never a time you say, I arrived. Right. This is the great delusion of the old in the old country. I arrived. I'm a Christian. I'm Orthodox. I got it in my, as they say in Greek, I have it in my pocket. I got mm. it. I got my orthodoxy in my pocket. I got it secure. It's like my wallet, right? Mm. You are in delusion. Like you are pathetic. It God help you because that's exactly you don't have anything if you think you've got that experience. But if you don't have a coach and you don't have an example and you don't have somebody to inspire you, it makes perfect sense you're going to say I'm tired. This is what's the point? Or you're going to want to make the church into a social club. You're going to mm -hmm. want to secularize the church. You're going to want to make it palatable. Don't challenge me. Don't push me because, after all, what's the point, right? I can't achieve. I'm never going to make it to the NBA. Let's face it. I'm never going to make it to the NBA, right? So yeah. what's the point? Why yeah. get up in the morning and run? That's a good word, Father. That's a good word. I think for me, <clears throat> the thing that I have found, and it's just probably my context, um, and I don't mean necessarily just locally in my parish, but just, you know, my generation of people who've come into the church and is actually introducing them to the ascetic life of the church, because there's a lot of um, Orthodox that have come in uh, over the last 25 plus years from various um, kind of small T traditions and experiences of a very, you know, um, American kind of um, strand of thinking and the ascetic life of the church has been relegated to something that are either for fanatics, meaning people who are playing monk or it's for the monks that are on Athos, not the monks that are here, you know, but the, the, the hermits on Athos and then those who are pretending and the ascetic life is not for anyone else. I used and to hear I, that all the time in my, my parish, and we were in the we were an hour away from Mount Athos, and mm -hmm. the the folks in the parish would say, "Father, that's for Mount Athos. Why are you telling us that we can't do that?" Yeah, it was the, yeah. that was the excuse. Yeah, yeah. And what I what I have found, um, you know, and I guess I guess <laughs> other I guess parishioners of spiritual children will agree or disagree, but I, what I found is introducing them to the ascetic life. What I found is that's the smallest and, and simplest and effective thing at this point to really inspire them, to wake them up. Mm. Um, and, and I think it's one of the things that when I look at the, um, the kind of lay of the land right now, Father, uh, I, I think that even still with all the um, inspiration to, to, to learn and to, you know, kind of um, ingest content in a good way. I don't mean that in a negative way, in a good way. I still think, though, the, like, basic ascetic life mm. is not seen as, you know, absolutely necessary to a lot of Orthodox. And yet there is no Orthodoxy without asceticism. Right. It is impossible. It doesn't exist. That's right. Because it's I'm, the cross. And right. if you don't take up your cross and follow after him, you are not his disciple. It's that simple. And and he says only through prayer and fasting did the demons get driven out. So if you're not involved in prayer and fasting, you have ceased to struggle. You have right. ceased to walk the cross. Like Father, forgive me, forgive me, Cyprian. I just want to say this real quick, and I'll I'll, I'll back out. But you know, just to, and this is the nature of our show, Father. So forgive me. You know, we go there. But um, with self abuse, I don't. You show me someone who's struggling with self abuse. I'll show you someone who's not fasting. Period period, you know, 
Um, you show me someone who's had some some victory in it, you know, I guarantee there's been some measure of fasting, some measure of ascetic practice into it. It isn't just some sort of intellectual, moralistic thing. You know, it's it's deeply rooted and it takes the whole person, the whole of the person, not just mind and thought to to deal with it, you know. Yeah, well, absolutely. Absolutely, Father. It is very interesting that I, I do think that it is asceticism that is actually drawing especially men to orthodoxy right now. Um, I, I know that if it wasn't, if, if it, I can say that the ascetic aspect of orthodoxy is without it, I, I don't think that I would have, th that it would have resonated with me at all because everything that I've done of value in my life, there's been an ascetic aspect to it everything right mm -hmm. so it's like and the, the things that the things that have mm -hmm. been the the that have given the most value to my life of course there's been some aspect of fasting there's been some aspect of perhaps sleep deprivation some aspect of you know keeping to a very strict schedule on something again getting out to the basketball court at four mm -hmm. in the morning or whatever mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. and even and you know you can see this in, incredible inversion that's going on on the secular side of the of the whole like kind of manosphere and all of these role models and the people like Andrew Tate or David Goggins or these types of people that it's really this, it is a hunger for asceticism. Mm -hmm. Men now, it seems, especially young men, that's what's missing in their life is is that natural. And I think we, we have this natural drive. It's part of being certainly of being a man. Women have women have their are going to have their suffering naturally right if they're if they're going through things they're going to have their, these periods of suffering that they can't that they can't get over but this this structured ability to sacrifice i think that this is the this is well it's obviously the expression of christ right. it's, it's the expression and then but we and what it is is that it's there everybody wants it but it's so inverted mm -hmm. the modern inversion mm -hmm. that's there well, the and it's it, Go ahead, and there's, no, there's no meaning without asceticism, ultimately. If you look at the secular world, the heroes in the secular world are still those who did, were deprived, were sacrificed, struggled, right? Whether it be athletes, or whether it be World, World War II heroes that, you know, gave up their life for their neighbor, et cetera, et cetera. You can't find a good story that doesn't have a hero, and that hero is not struggling, sacrificing, because asceticism is not just living in a cave or fasting extremely or whatever. Asceticism is everything you do for Christ and in Christ, you sacrifice for the sake of Christ. In other words, you get up in the middle of the night and you feed the baby. That's an ascetic struggle. You get up and you, you sacrifice your time, your money, your everything you do, but it's in Christ and for Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Those that's gotta be, that's gotta be the, uh, there. Otherwise it really is not Christian Orthodox Christian asceticism, but if, but it's it's not limited to the traditional or the well-known methods of vigil, fasting, and prayer. You can't really be without those, but it's not limited to those. And I think people think that they have to, to be an ascetic, they have to go off somewhere into some desert or some mountain. That's not the case at all, right? No, you gotta, I can, if I may just, this is an interesting thing I did actually want to bring up independently, and I think there is kind of a link to what we're talking about. I have noticed a trend among people who seem to be returning to dumb phones. I think that they've noticed like the limit, like the draw, the, um, the kind of filthy nature of having a smartphone mm -hmm. of like, of this, like the doom scrolling, the doom scrolling, the doom scrolling. So I've noticed it in my personal circle. My wife has a dumb phone and I've noticed a number of people have asked her about it. And just the other night, you know, out of nowhere, this guy was like, yeah, I'm thinking about going back to a dumb phone so much so that I think someone, I can't remember who published an article. I think there is this like, maybe we've reached in some small aspect of it, this tipping point of people realizing like, oh, wait, this in this sense, like, I don't think they would ever say it's for spirituality, but this kind of mindless self-indulgence, this constant staring at a screen is really getting to me. It's really deadening me in a way that I'm realizing. And of course, what they're seeking is Christ. But I think they'll, under the flag of mental health or self-care or something like that, say like, I've decided to go with a dumb phone because of this. But it's something I've at least noticed that 
there is, seems to be this draw away from at least some of the luxuries and kind of mindless scrolling that has become so like common normally. So that's it's it. a search for meaning. I think they want to get out of all that distraction. Mm-hmm. It's emptiness at the end. So they want to go deeper and they just, they, they can't, you know, it's very hard to, to control yourself when you've got all that in front of you. So God bless them. Yeah. It's a good trend if it's happening. And, you know, indulgence is a key to all of it. I think that um, the nature of the life that so many, everyone that could hear a voice has lived in regards of just absolute and decadent luxury. Um, and the, the natural, the natural struggle, the penance that God baked, baked into the fall was, you know, we're always seeking to get around that penance. Mm. Of of work and the penance of struggle, the penance we're children of, of Cain. We children. like civilization, utopia. Yeah, right. It's looking forward to build a utopia. That's it. That's what it's all about. Transhumanism is going to give us utopia on Earth. That's it. That's same it. old, same old, same temptation hasn't changed one bit. That's it. Yep, that's amazing. We're seeing you know, it really large now. It's funny too because uh, getting back to the the aesthetic piece and 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 seeing how you know it's one of the reasons like for instance like in uh, you know certain uh, communities and not just limited to African Americans although it's it's largely like in the states but if you go in the UK and parts of Europe you know um, traditional people from various European co- countries I mean the 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 convert rate of Islam is growing. What is the what is the what is the attraction of Islam? I mean, I think the attraction of Islam for a lot of people, it's not the doctrine. <laughs> you know, it's not it's it's not it's not the wisdom, but there's 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 that um that self-light and that that um the ability to rely on one's own strength that's kind of baked into it. The asceticism of Islam is the asceticism of, of the self. You know, Islam is this a self oriented religion, you know, it's 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 self orientation wrapped in the guise of religion, and it, mm-hmm. and it really tugs at the heart of men who are living in just soft and indulgent context, and they see it, and they want to find a way to, you know, tap into what they know they should be, um, but everything around them is keeping them from it, and so they see Islam, and it seems like, yeah, that makes sense. That's kind of connecting to. I think what Cyprian was saying, you know, with like, let's say Andrew Tate, let's say, you know, who, you know, very who converted famous, to Islam, very, very famously converted to Islam and said that he sees no point in Christianity because Christianity soft and Christianity, you know, do, you know, essentially does nothing with its enemies. And so, so what Christianity was he referring to? Not I don't know that, right? Not right? Orthodox. That's not the Christianity I've experienced so far. I don't know what he's talking about. And he was in Romania. Like, Correct. did he go- did he walk up the street to one of the thousands of monasteries that that country has? What, where was well, he? what's interesting about that, too, is he was in Romania. There was a period of time we started talking about orthodoxy very, 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 very briefly. He even I think I, I saw one one clip of him where he like crossed himself or something like that. He was flirting with it. But what's what's really sad is obviously he didn't come across these great elders like Houston Parvu and George Calchu and, you know, uh, Roman Braganam and all the other saints of the prison. He didn't, he didn't read about the other. He didn't do these, these things weren't, he didn't, he wasn't able or did not access these things. So there's a real tragedy there because Romania has this treasure trove. I mean, out to Cleopa, you know I mean? What a, well, it's a total tragedy because he's not going to find anything like that in Islam. I mean, maybe Sufi will have some kind of fabricated version of that, but that's it, and and it and he's gonna it's gonna be very external, and it's not gonna change anything internally. So I mean, that's probably what the appeal is. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, Father, but yeah. that's probably the appeal. The appeal is, I get to, I get to do these cool things. I get to pray in this cool and unique and different way, and but I don't really have to do any inner work because it's it's, I'm sure it's the teachings of the church. It's also my personal experience that that one path that no one wants to go down. It's that one path that that's what, where Christ is. Like, that's the dark path with all the, like, wood covering it, you know, it's like, do not enter type of stuff. And you have to go through that path to get to Christ. At least that's been my experience because I tried looking at every other way and it just all ended in ego. 
I liked an expression I heard many years ago from Father Thomas Hopko. He said, you got to be willing to smell the stench of your own soul. And that's absolutely right. And that's it's, it's very similar to what I would hear from my professor, Professor Chelenghidis. He would say that, and he would take it from St. Paisios. St. Paisios, the Athenite, said that what we, you know, in, in the mysteries of baptism, chrismation, the Eucharist, when we're initiating the Christ, everything is given to us. There's nothing lacking. The kingdom of God has been imparted, right? So you say, well, where's the fruit? Well, what we do is we bury that kingdom underneath a whole pile, a landfill of garbage, which is our desires, our passions, our sicknesses of the soul, right? So to get past that and to uncover that treasure which is within, who is Christ, Christ is the kingdom of God, we've got to do a lot of bringing up the garbage, and we've got to be willing to smell the stench, as he says. That is not easy. It's very, very difficult to do for most people. They don't want to face who they are. They don't want to come to terms with their inner world. Self-knowledge is, however, absolutely essential if you're going to come to theognosia, God knowledge. These two things are inseparable. And so, you know, you can be an Islamist, you can be an atheist, you can be all these isms and never have to go that path. You don't have to really discover the inner man. And not, and maybe there's some various versions that come and they talk about similar aspects of that, like in the Eastern religions. But the problem is that what they're what they're going to discover is just man. It's going to be human, mm -hmm. whereas the Christian has been given the eternal, mm -hmm. divine, the theanthropos, right? It, it, according to grace, and and so there's a lot of imitation of that self knowledge in Eastern religions, but there's no positive discovery of the pearl of great price there's a, at, the end of, at the end of the rainbow it's nirvana it's nothingness and so you you know you're instead of discovering that which is you know that which is i am who i am on you discover aniparxia you discover non-existence mm -hmm. and it's extremely uh you know black and dark so that you're absolutely right. That's the that's really the ultimate uh, aim of all the asceticism, isn't it? To dis, to to get the purification, to get rid of all the garbage, and to see and to see as if in a mirror, like the image that you've been restored to. You see that in the mirror. Uh, once you get rid of all the garbage, you see Christ, and then of course the whole process is to go from that restoration, that gift of the image being restored to the likeness. And that's the whole path of, of asceticism and 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 the, the life in the Christ is to become like Christ, katakhari, according to grace. And uh, that's not that's not an easy path, right? That's a that's a path of uh, of crucifixion of the mind, crucifixion of the will, crucifixion of the desires. It's a constant crucifixion. And in insofar as orthodoxy preaches that and lives it, mm -hmm. uh, it will shine. It will shine. The mission will continue. And so far as we don't. Then we're 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 the obstacles. Like they'll come to our parish, but they will not see Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what, is, what is what is the necessity of a spiritual father in terms of, or to what level is a spiritual father a necessity in terms of seeing and re removing that garbage? In the in the you, your both of your opinions. In my in my experience, is is important uh, as going to a, a very fine doctor who will uncover the causes of your various ailments and 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 give you the medicine necessary for you to become well physically. It's far more important as spiritual. You can't. It is it is that you know. I'll tell you just a story just to answer that. You know, I growing up in America, being a spoiled brat and all the rest that we are in America. I went to Greece. I found my spiritual father in Monathos. And he would constantly he would constantly tell me, in no uncertain terms, how pathetic and useless I am as a human being. Because I was raised to constantly narcissistically fulfill my desires, right? And he would say, you're worthless. I mean, it was, you know, he would humble me exceedingly. And I still, I'm sure, did not make anywhere near the progress that I could have if I was more receptive to what he was saying. But that role of the coach, that role of the, uh, you know, we see like in St. Joseph the Hesychus, where he's kind, he didn't say, he didn't call Elder Frem by his name for 15 years or 12, 13 years mm -hmm. he was together. That's right. Even though he loved him immensely. But because he wanted him to reach the depths of humility, the extreme humility, 
because that's where he's going to then build that spiritual house, which we now see the fruit of, you know, 30 monasteries, not 20, 30 monasteries, 10 in Greece, uh, and hundreds and thousands of spiritual children. How'd that happen? Because he went deep in humility, and he learned as, from the foundation up that you can't build a spiritual house except with great, great humility. How are you going to reach that if you don't have a spiritual father who knows the spiritual life and shapes and forms you? You're not going to reach that. You can't. Can you do anything? Can you become a woodworker? Can you become a plumber if you don't? My son now is is doing electrician. He has to go to school. He has to sit at the feet of the electricians to become a great, you know, he's got to go all. It doesn't happen without the spiritual father. It's almost impossible. There are exceptions to every rule, but it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. And the exceptions, in many ways, prove the rule. I mean, yes. uh, to, to give the except, you know, and he's not even an exception, but it's one of the closest things I could bring up. You know, like um, Saint Silouan. You know, Saint Silouan had spiritual fathers, but you know, he's he didn't have this um, classic one and one. You know, he, that was developed with him and Sophroni, with him being the spiritual father. But but that proves the point because even from that. You see that what's the next step? Well, he he becomes the founder. I was just sharing this with I was actually sharing this with my spiritual daughter tonight. So Froni is the the multi floored, multi leveled skyscraper that people see. That's that's what's that's what Sophroni is. But what people don't see is this very simple but incredibly strong foundation of Silouan. That's that is how it works. And I think that when people take in mind that, you know, that foundation of the spiritual father pointing the person to Christ, you know, the Lord saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, the spiritual father is always the one who's saying back to Christ, come back to Christ, come back to Christ. You know, you're being self-sufficient. You're being, you know, the, the autonomy, you know, not even just being the weak, not even just, you know, get up, but sometimes being strong in your own sense and falling into delusion. I think that's one of the things that needs to come up the most. And I think that's why a lot of people are struggling right now because a lot of people are hungry, but they are recognizing a real absence of spiritual fathers. Not that there isn't priests, but you know, there's, there's various reasons, you know, I, I mean, there's, there well, are one of the things that father we have to stress though, is that, Okay, so we don't have a lot of spiritual fathers. We don't have a lot of experience. We don't have a lot of monasticism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, before I forget, I want to say I correct myself. He didn't. He, my elder didn't say you're worthless. That that was not what he said. I, I tr translated that wrong. He said you're useless. That's different. It's different because you know, just as I didn't have, I didn't do, I never learned a lot. You know, until I, until as a young man, I was. We don't we don't learn a lot in America. Like we don't know how to do. Like keep a garden. We don't. You know, right. we we grow up in front of televisions and 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 microwave. So, we're, but anyway, getting back to the thing is that we okay. We don't have a whole treasure trove of experienced spiritual fathers in in the mission field. That's that's kind of natural, right? That kind of makes sense, right? If you're a young church, you don't have a lot of experience, you don't have a lot of monasticism, and so people say, "Well, what do you do then?" You know, I don't have. But here's the mystery of confession: the mystery of the spiritual father is that analogous with your humility, analogous with your struggle. God, in spite of the donkey that is this spiritual father, for instance, he's going to speak through him. He's going to give you the word unless he's heterodox, right? unless he's fallen away from orthodoxy. Well, then, then God can do, can, cannot really work through him. If he's teaching heresy or if he's teaching things that are contrary to the gospel, then, then there's a problem. You need to, you need to flee. But if they're, if they're orthodox and they're, they're struggling to be orthodox, but they don't have a ton of experience, that does not disqualify them as spiritual guides, but it, it it is in every case. Even if you have a saint in front of you, if you go there and you are not analog have an analogous struggle to listen, to hear, to understand, to open yourself up to, to humble yourself, uh, then you will not make progress. Right? There, are, this is one of the mistakes people make. They say, "Well, he was a disciple of Saint So and So." That doesn't mean anything, really. Ultimately, it could mean a lot, could mean nothing, because they're free. And Judas was a disciple of Christ. I was going to say Judas was a disciple of Christ. So, right. so I want to stress that in the mystery of confession, in the mystery of spiritual fatherhood, it's Christ who's working. Because there are a lot of people who, who've come to me and said, well, Father, yeah, but, you know, in reality, my priest, whatever, he doesn't understand this. Doesn't it does Ultimately, 
you're not you're not sitting in front of the man. You're sitting in front of Christ, of which he is the type, right? And he is in the place of Christ. But Christ is in our midst. He's in the midst of every mystery of the church. And we have to believe that, and we have to go deeper. And so, it, and then it'll change everything. Because think about it. I'm going to confession to Christ. Are you going to go, you're going to prepare more? You're going to go, hopefully, with more humility, if you know who Christ is. Unless, you, if you see only a man, then you're going to have a totally different experience and approach to the mystery. I was just, I was actually just telling my little four and a half year old daughter about this is somehow, I don't remember how we were talking about bad priests. And I was like, but honey, and she's like, so is it bad to go to a bad priest? And I was like, well, we don't always want to listen to a bad priest. A priest who doesn't love God is what she was saying, or doesn't know God is what she says. Um, And I was like, yeah, but we have to understand that God is also bigger than that bad priest. Like if he makes like, if that priest is serving the liturgy and he gives you communion, that's the same communion. Like that God is bigger than that. Like God has obviously taken into account that not all of his priests are going to be good. I mean, like I, I don't remember who I heard it, but like one twelfth of all priests are going to be bad because Judas, like one twelfth of priests are always going to, I can't remember. I heard that somewhere. But like Christ obviously has taken into account that he knew that there was going to have to be times where in like not in like not because of the priest, but in spite of the or, you know, through the priest, even though he's not good, Christ would still work. And like, I don't know, it was pretty comforting to my daughter because she was like, oh, so God still really got this. Like God's still completely in control of this whole situation. I was like, yes. And then unless he's saying something really bad, then we do flee him. Like if he's saying something that's not good, yeah, that this just, is the know, really comforter. This is the royal path. And we can commemorate your title of your your show. Is It's absolutely everywhere. And this is so important to know. Like, so to keep that balance, that balance you just described is essential because there's really dangers on the right and there's dangers on the left and people are falling into it left and right today. And so it's Christ who's given and gives in every mystery. And so the minute you say that a mystery is present, the baptism is there, the chrismation is there, the Eucharist is there, whatever, you're not saying that there is, you know, the institution. You're saying Christ is present and he's giving himself and he's given. And the priest is either cooperating or fighting on a personal level. And so uh, you, you, as a priest, we can be, cooperating and therefore the grace of god uh, is let's say more easily manifest is man it's it's multiplied or we can be an obstacle to that and 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 essentially uh in, you know the, the the mystery is happening christ is still giving himself and is and and is given but we're we're essentially not participating on a personal level and we're not being sanctified it's up to us. Like, there's nothing automatic anywhere in the church. Mm-hmm. There's nothing automatic anywhere. There's, we, there's nothing, there's this whole approach to a kind of a legalistic, it doesn't matter, you know, how we are. No, it does matter. But what does it affect? It affects th- the person who has no desire for synergy. He is affected. Like, so there could be bishops today who are teaching heresy, completely void of the Holy Spirit. And yet they still are bishops and still the mystery is working through them mm-hmm. until they are condemned by a council and the church has rejected them because they are unrepentant of their of their uh, heresy. But uh, they could be there and yet they themselves, because the, as my, my professor would say, the canons spiritually work immediately on the person. So somebody, let's say, uh, uh, let's say somebody commits fornication or adultery. Mm -hmm. The canons don't work after five years when they go to confession. The canons meaning the spiritual separation of the person from God, right? That's the, that's the essence of all the, the the canons of the church aren't legal things. They're describing to us the boundaries of the spiritual life. They're telling us how spiritual life works. They're giving us the directions, how to be restored when we fall, et cetera, et cetera. So when the church says, and the Lord says in the commandments, if you commit this, you, you lose immediately the grace of God. It doesn't it doesn't we don't need to go to confession or to be reprimanded? Now, what happens is that the church, however, has to apply the canons. 
And only when they're applied are they manifested and they work, let's say, communally, socially. Okay. So somebody can preach heresy, lose the grace of God, but until the church in council applies the canons to that person, that person's still a bishop, a priest, in good standing, it comes to the church, etc. They might be communion under condemnation. But until there's an application of, of the of the uh, uh of the teachings of the church in, in confession or in a council, that doesn't take effect for the rest of the church. It doesn't take effect and manifest itself on a on, let's say on the horizontal plane among us. And that's an important distinction because it keeps us on the royal path, right? Because if you like you're saying, if you say you can become like a Donatist very easily. Uh, if you start to say, well, this priest is a bad priest, this priest is a angry priest, this priest is a, I don't know, immoral priest, therefore, I'm leaving the Orthodox Church. People do it all the time. Mm -hmm. People fall into that delusion, and they walk away from Christ on the on the account of the bad priest or the bad bishop. And I, and I tell these people, because they write me occasionally, I say, uh, you know, this makes no sense. Like, you're going to walk away from, away from Christ... Because somebody else is walking away from Christ. <laughs> that, See, this is this forgive is, me. I'm sorry. Father, what's a Donatist? I just, I don't know what that is. Uh, that's a that's a, a particular uh, a schismatic heretic in North Africa in the uh, third and fourth century who rejected the church because and and the priests and bishops of the church because uh, they identified the moral or spiritual state or standing of them with the legitimacy of the mystery or of the church, right? And and so St. Augustine famously writes against the Donatist in his in his uh, work. Uh, now, that's a whole other podcast, and it's got a lot of nuance, a lot of history there, but um, it's, it's basically a, an error in understanding the nature of the mystery of the church, identifying it with the human element only, losing sight, and 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 a big part of that is understanding how the conciliar nature of the church works. And so we have today we we have people who have fallen away in, in a similar way, not exactly like the Donatists, but in a similar way on the right, uh, the, the temptation on the right, right. So they fall away from the community, the church, uh, fighting against the sicknesses of the day with whatever ism that we're fighting, and instead of uh, being united to the church and fighting these things. In communion with the church, they break communion with the church and they fight, which is self self defeating. Anyway, it's another another discussion. It, but it, it's it is important because it always comes from. It's just one example of these issues come from a misunderstanding and ignorance of the nature of the church. Yes. And when people, oftentimes, you know, we bring our baggage, and I, I think, and. Please, you know, correct me, Father Peter, but I think even people who have been raised, you know, in the church but are Americans, they're still susceptible to kind of laying this lens of having an American Protestant evangelical approach to the church, even though they've been in the church, the Orthodox Church, their whole life, because of the way that we operate as a society in yeah. America and this tendency, you know, it's not even about guruism per se. It's really about just not understanding what the nature and the work of the church is in regards of the purification of man and what that actually is. You know, not just getting someone to be a good citizen so they can get greater accolades, but really, you know, like you were saying earlier, bringing out the filth of the heart, bringing out these areas in which they're separated from God and from their fellow man. And the fact of the matter is there's a lot of people who just they are not interested in that. You know, they're, they're interested in maintaining something that facilitates this visage of I'm a good citizen. I'm a good fill in the blank. And very legalistic. It's very legalistic. Very and legalistic. And, and it's, it's, yeah. it's tough because when people have the blessing for their eyes to be opened, oft, oftentimes they run from it. And it's, it's God actually inviting them into a deeper life. And they see it as something else. And, and I think, you know, today, we were commemorating you know, the translation of the relics of um, St. Athanasius. And St. Athanasius, he's just this great example, because on the one hand, absolutely, Athanasius is against the world. And it's so heroic and it's so courageous. But one of the things that I always find encouraging when I, when I reflect on St. Athanasius is that in spite of such widespread heresy with Arianism, 
the church still was the church, you know, and God still was able to, um, in fact, you know, his, his strength being revealed in weakness, you know, should we sin less grace abound heaven forbid. That's not what I'm saying, but there's something I think to look at these accounts and that light as well in regards you of. You have to remember the fourth century is hailed as the century, the golden age of the church, mm -hmm. but it's a little misleading because if you were to be in the fourth century, especially after the first council till the second council from the th 25 until 81, and you read church history, read the lives of the saints, you will see it was chaos, mm -hmm. and most were Arians, and a few were Orthodox, and the Orthodox were constantly exiled. And so what's the golden about that age exactly? It's exactly that those few remain strong and confessed. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you know that, you're protected against rash, quick judgments that lead you into the various isms and the various extremes. And I was going to say earlier that the default stance of the people you're talking about is going to be either Protestant, Reform Protestantism or Papal Protestantism, as I, as I like to say. They're both Protestantism, according to Komiakov, right? The Pope is the first Protestant. So we have Western rejection of Catholicity. That's what happened in the West, the wholeness. And, and that's what's constantly presented. The devil constantly presents two options they're both his right choose and he says choose free to choose you're free to choose it's like thank you very much you're such a generous you know <laughs> noble creature that you give me two choices that are both damnation right they're both delusion no no thank you there's a third way that you're hiding the world doesn't understand it's the way of crucifixion it's the narrow path it's the mm -hmm. royal path mm -hmm. uh it's the path that few take and understand because it it demands trust in Christ and the world doesn't trust anybody and anything. So th this is the this is the these are the dangers today that the, the, the people have to go through a a seethe of purification. They're bringing with them the baggage of the various isms, the two extremes, the bad choices and they always want to default to those things and say, "Well, okay, I know that's what I know. I'm used to that. I want to I operate like a Protestant. Now I'm Orthodox." I get I'm orthodox theoretically. I'm orthodox dogmatically. People have this idea, especially unfortunately in the Western Rite, because I know my father was a Western Rite priest for about 10 years before he he changed. And they have this mistake that orthodoxy is the absence of heterodoxy. Mm. Like if I get rid of the filioque and blah blah blah, and what a couple other things, I can basically remain an Anglican. Mm. or whatever and mm. i can remain a uniate you know because there's uniates coming to the orthodox because you know, mm. basically it was already you know it's all as long as it doesn't explicitly be heterodoxy it must be orthodoxy no mm. no not at all mm. there's all kinds of layers of delusion mm. and the way of life and we have to change our whole way of life we have right. to open ourselves up to a whole change of way of life and 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 perspective uh, and it's so this purification process has to happen. Otherwise, we will default again and again to what we know, which is the various isms uh, on the right and left. Uh, and that danger is very, very prevalent in among the Orthodox. But that gets us to the what we were talking about the beginning of the conversation in regards to repentance. It's it's analogous to the person who says, you know, I, I stopped drinking or stopped self abuse, but if you don't start pursuing abstinence and chastity as a virtue. That cessation of the of the sin will only go so far. The pursuing of that virtue, that's when it becomes repentance, and that's what begins to erode and transfigure that passion. But you know, you know, in my experience, in my experience, the, the sin of self-abuse, which is so prevalent among young men and women, by the way, a lot of women uh, act like this is not a problem. It's a problem among women because of such gross pornography and, and fornication in society. But the, it is essentially a drug. Mm -hmm. they're, they're seeking escape from the world. It's it's the dopamine in another another package, and they want uh, they're 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 defaulting to that as a way to avoid what we talked about earlier, which is coming to self knowledge, which is frightening, right? And also having to uh, de deprive ourselves of the easy path. But basically, it's seeking consolation in that which is. Immediate, easy, and and but uh, a big trap, 
because it, it ultimately doesn't console anything. It makes the conscience suffer. And anybody who has a little bit of a conscience is going to suffer greatly after this sin. But it's it's the same thing, again, whether you're, you're addicted to sex, you're addicted to self-abuse, you're addicted to various uh, drugs, uh, alcohol, food, all of the material things. People are looking for consolation. Uh, and they can only ultimately find consolation in God, right? So they, so that how do we deal with uh, you know alcohol is anonymous or spiritually not like the world? It's similar with the self abuse. You've got to you've got to come and and be come to the point where you are so sickened by that fake mm-hmm. consolation, and you you have to hate it. You have to come to hate it. If you don't hate it. You'll never really be free of it, uh, and and we don't really hate sin most of the time, right? No. We don't really hate it. We we are called to hate sin, not the sinner, but sin. And then we can. So, so I I give people uh, the the footnote uh, from Exumologitarian of Saint Nicodemus, and it is shocking. Like you read that, and you're like, it's like a cold shower, real quick. He talks about all of the effects of, of self-abuse on the soul and the body. Uh, and if you have a little conscience, you're going to be like, God help me. Because this is this is so destructive, right? Because it's so egotistical. Mm-hmm. It's so egotistical. Self-abuse is so egotistical, right? And you just get lost in yourself and you're so absorbed in your in your pleasure seeking this, you know. And it's the opposite of communion. It's the opposite of kenosis, self-emptying, and so it's 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 diabolical. It's dis- I was going to say, yeah. in the truest sense, it's demonic. In the yeah, it's sense. totally demonic. Yeah, you become like the demons who are so obsessed with their own, you know, um, you know, light. Like the Lucifer, what happened to Lucifer? He, he he gazed on the light, which was he was just a reflection of the light, right? He gazed on that, and he said, "No, no, no, I'm the source." Mm-hmm. That light that's coming and it's reflecting and, and it's brilliant because I have this wonderful like mirror and it shines off of me and, and it gives off an immense, immense amount of light because I'm the greatest of the angels and the pure intellect. And he, he ceased to give glory to the source and he was enamored with his own life. It was as if it was his own light. And so every time we do that, we, we, we cease to glorify God and look out and be in communion and give thanks we turn inward and we become obsessed with our own self and our own pleasure and our own pleasure seeking, then we are like unto the demons. We become like them. So people say, well, God sends people to hell. No, 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 no. Nobody goes to hell who doesn't want to go to hell. That's right. Everybody chooses. They go there freely. It's not for them. It wasn't made for them. It wasn't prepared for them. It's not natural. It's not. God does not want it. But if we end up there, it's because we imitated them, right? So why again? Why is it so important to have the saints in t- always before us? The the gospel always before us, right? The gospel is the is the perennial. Like when you see the gospel in Holy Week, that is life in every generation, in every community, in every parish. That is a that is the type of every uh, life in every age, right? So you've got to have that before us. You've got to have the lives of the saints before us. Christ in the lives of the saints in every age it's christ again and again and again and again right that's 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 who we look at when we look at the saints we look at christ so you've got to have that before you because otherwise that emptiness will be filled by all of the demonic uh, examples let's imitate all of those who are possessed by demons who are who are uh, ruled by passions what is hollywood what is what are, what are the contemporary po- politicians what are all these people who are living for the passions they're 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 examples of damnation of loss of 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 hell ultimately they're walking not everyone but i'm saying the the, the bad examples of those who who are in, embracing fame who are embracing fornication who are reveling in you know all the passions the the devil presents that can constantly to say imitate these well, because he knows that. they will lead to uh being united to them and found so behind all the passions of the demons right so if you if you say yes to all your passions you're saying yes to demons you're not you say not just a human thing there's a demonic element behind all the all the passions that's how they that's how they hook us and then we imitate them we become like them and then so when we depart this life we're already in hell right right, right? i'm saying the gospel today and literally this morning the gospel in john today when our lord saying how he's the father lies and uh, i'm saying you know there's the false light 
And, you know, the way that they're developing technology can camouflage by bending light. If you can bend and reflect light in a certain way, something's hidden. And mm. Lucifer, the light bringer, he's, has, mm. he's learned to infect and to delude humans with everything that you're saying. But it's, it's light. It is light. But this bending, this twisting of this light and giving a false light and people become enamored by it. And it's in that egoism, all this false light, it brings them to this place, just like you said, Father, where they enter into that delusion. And the only way out of it is the cross. You know, there isn't going to be a single person who finds himself in perdition that has embraced the cross. Not one. Just like there isn't going to be one person in paradise who did not embrace the cross. Every single person in paradise that will come across, if we make it God willing, would have embraced the cross. And every single person that finds himself in perdition would have rejected the cross. And that's that's an absolute statement. And that bending of light is... That's he's always deceived. He's always lied. And the lie is that twisting of the truth, the twisting of light. It's, I, was, it's, I was talking with a brother from the church and <clears throat> I've never read it. He was talking about the great divorce by C.S. Lewis. Yeah. And he was talking about the one day that uh, the people from hell were allowed to visit heaven. And basically one of the people from hell met the person. And I could be wrong. I, I could be being misremembering this story, but this is how I remember this guy telling it to me is that he met the person who like murdered his daughter and his daughter and his daughter's murderer was in heaven while he was in hell. Mm -hmm. And he basically walked up to the guy and was like, you murdered my daughter. You did that. And the guy was like, I'm so incredibly sorry. I don't know why I did that. It was terrible. I shouldn't have done it. I don't deserve to be here. And the guy whose daughter was murdered looks at him and says, if you're here, I don't want to be here and turns around and walks back and like just sits in like the bus until they leave. And so that's that whole like, well, if you don't want to be in heaven, you're not going to be in heaven. Like if you want to like sit in that bitterness and that anger, which is like what you said, father, you're very comfortable with the idea. Father Turbo, sorry, was very comfortable with the idea of hell being eternal. Because it's like you see it. You see when people are so calcified in that negativity, in that in that demonic mm -hmm. behavior that like you and you see it, you offer them this like, you know, Christ through you offers them this light. You just reach out and they pretty all, all but physically slap it away and turn back to the TV to keep watching whatever they're watching and sitting there and stewing and smoking their cigarettes and eating their bad food and stuff. Well, it's so frightening because the, the thing is that people don't understand the gift that God's given us and how powerful it is that we have the ability to choose, the, the, the freedom that God's endowed us with, that we all have squandered at some point in time in regards to becoming a slave to sin instead of a slave to righteousness. Slave to righteousness is, is the only real freedom. You know, God is the only one who actually honors freedom. And, and that's what's I, I, I really, you know, I, I know it's hard for people to wrap their mind around it, but they can't wrap their mind around it because of, you know, broken, fallen perspectives and an ignorance of, of not just who God is, but who man is, because we don't know who God is. You know, it's almost like Father was saying, Father Peter was saying earlier about, you know, what is a Christian? If you don't know what a Christian is, then you can't really understand what it is to be man, what it is, you know, man meaning mankind, right? And so because of this absence of the knowledge of God, we don't understand how precious and dangerous the freedom that we have is. This is and the biggest problem in the West, and they've had this problem in all the world really today because we're all Western, uh, little by little, the Western culture, Western ideas have dominated. And, but it is this, this they, they cannot crucify their mind on the cross of freedom. Right, they're scandalized, and they and they end up with soteriologies like the Calvinist one, which is a total blasphemy and mm -hmm. of God against God. But they end up there because they cannot understand freedom and 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 what it means, why God wants and gives it to human beings, and it has to be there. There can be no love right. if there's any force whatsoever. Sure. There can be, and so God cannot. You cannot be in a communion without you without totally wanting to be in that communion god will never force because then he'll cease to be god right because god is love 
So this is the hardest part. Uh, people want, and even those who've committed themselves to Orthodox, they still want an automatic legalistic mm -hmm. uh, a, a mechanism for salvation. Mm -hmm. They want answers in that realm. I get so many questions and the answers they want are give me a quick, you know, easy mm -hmm. legalistic type answer for these very uh, murky or, or, or di difficult and to discern uh, questions. And, and uh, you know, time and again, I'm, I, I come back with things that I don't think people are really satisfied with because it doesn't fit into that. Well, they want a patent answer, Father. They want a system. People want a system. They want a patent answer. They want something that... And forgive me, people want to be in control. Because if you have a system, you have control. If I can wrap my mind around it, because that's how we work as Westerners. If I understand something, if I know the thing, I'm its master. Mm. And so mm. no one would acknowledge that because when you lay it out like that, it says, no, that's not me. That's me. Not me. But de facto, how we live things out. Because they're insecure. Because yes. they're insecure. Yes. The insecure person wants to have control. He, the fact that he ha doesn't have it and wants it shows that he's actually doesn't have it. Like he's insecure. I think so much of the problems that people are facing in their life and they don't make progress spiritually is because they are insecure. In other words, they don't trust. They haven't learned to trust. And even people in the church, like mm -hmm. people in the church come in and they, they're, and you know, there's a lot of reasons that people can cite. You can cite, well, this, this bishop, that priest, this person, that, and, you know, this is what happened to me. Yeah, okay, but we're not here and we're not expecting from man anything. We're not here for any man, right. but for Christ. That's right. So if you have an experience of Christ and you've opened yourself up to him and you've become naked, you know, you've, you've put yourself on the operating table and you begin to be healed through that process, then you'll trust Christ in spite of all of the untrustworthy people who are struggling toward the light, even in the church? Uh, but this is uh, the, this is a this is the number one problem again and again. People come to me, at least in my experience, I don't know about yours, but people come to me and they're like, you know, I grew up and I was this happened to me with my parents, and this mm -hmm. happened to me with my brother, and this 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 abuse and this, you know, whatever, and I you know divorce, and and the, with one word, it is I can't trust. Mm -hmm. can't bring myself to humble and trust myself but everywhere in the gospel it's blessed are you for you trusted in other words that's that's what the faith is trust in this context right absolutely in the gospel it's trust he doesn't he says beastie but in the word for trust in greek is the word faith and pistosini is the word in greek for trust, trust. and mm -hmm. it essentially is in the context of the gospel that's what he's talking about Right. Mm -hmm. And not uh, faith like I believe in a God or he's ex he exists. Right. Like, that's not that's not the faith that we're talking about in the gospel. Right. And this is the this is the number one. Problem. It's not an accident that again and again and again, according to your faith, according to your trust, mm -hmm. this happens. To you. So today, if we look at all the sicknesses, we, we must know that the core at all this, these various sicknesses have one thing in common, and that is they can't trust. Mm -hmm. They haven't come to be able to trust God, trust the priest. And through the church, they're going to find and be saved, and et cetera, et cetera. And I think that it's very interesting to me to observe. And then I'm going to stop because I feel like uh, I'd like to, you know, maybe we need to go into other topics or whatever you guys like. But what I, I observe this very similar, spiritually speaking, very similar behavior, whether you're talking about people on the left or on the right, politically, but also Mainly, I'm talking about the various isms on the left. So ecumenism and the ecumenists that we call the ecumenists over here, and the zealots and the and the the the, the super, mm -hmm. uh, you know, undiscerning zealots on the right who've you know gone into schism, whatever. It's very similar behavior. I, I'm always amazed at that, and similar spiritual uh, dynamic. They're both uh, control oriented mm -hmm. and they're both suffering from lack of trust authoritarianism <laughs> for, for a variety of reasons and they and yet and that they think of themselves as opposites mm -hmm. right like you know during the communist period father Seraphim rose writes in the 50s he says there's no real difference spiritually between communism and capitalism they're both godless and they're both about utopia mm -hmm. right but you can't see and so i'm just saying there's there's many things that seem opposed but because they're godless or they don't have 
uh, they're not deep in in Christ. They have similar spiritual diseases, spirit, spiritual behaviors, uh, but different like you know angles. Let's say, uh, uh, and I'm always just fascinated by that because we, we're talking about the royal path. This is the royal mm-hmm. path podcast. I think that's that's a huge topic we could talk about sometime. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting to me too. I would just say. Um... You know, ignorance might people perish because of lack of knowledge and and the ignorance of not just, you know, let's say who God is, because an Orthodox Christian could say, well, recite the creed and there you go. There's my faith or whatever, but about how the spiritual life works. I mean, on a real basic level, I think that that's one of the things, too, that a lot of people are lacking because people aren't versed in, you know, what the cross looks like you know people i think have an abstract of what that is and that abstract you know kind of fixation that abstract image of it keeps them from seeing how christ is calling them to the cross everywhere like you said earlier about you know the nursing baby in the middle of the night you know someone might hear that and go like oh that's you know that's kind of a nice analogy that you're drawing but they don't understand no 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 if you actually enter into that and understand that God has provided the means. God's given you the crosses you need for your salvation. That's where that faith comes in, trusting. This is in front of me. And it's so simple that it becomes too difficult for people to apprehend. It's a lot like Naaman when he was bid, you know, Elisha bids him to go wash in the Jordan. He's, you know, get rid of his leprosy. He's like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And, you know, his, his, his servant says, Master, you know, you've done all these other things. You're not going to do this simple thing the prophet asks you. And, and the lack of humility and sure, all these things have happened, but it gets people in this place where they cannot recognize how in Christ's love and that it is Christ's love. The cross that's offered to them, that's him bidding them to come, to be saved. To, to be with him and to be with the saints because that's the basic foundation of spiritual life. Like those, that's the brick and the mortar of what the spiritual life is. But it's, it I think be- we have this uh, very idealistic or kind of superficial idea about asceticism and about the cross and about life in Christ. And, and that, and that's one of the reasons why behind people say, oh, I, I'm not, I can't leave the life, live the life of the monks on Mount Athos or something. Mm-hmm. Cause they always, they're looking at it externally, but Christ is, First of all, you're an Orthodox Christian. You're baptized Christian, made in a communion. Christ is within you. Mm-hmm. Right? Secondly, Christ and the providence of God, everything you do is under the guidance. He's either allowing or guiding. It's his either goodwill or his allowance. Everything is in the providence of God. Every single thing that happens in your life, nothing, he says, even the hair from your head mm-hmm. does not fall if it's not allowed by God and not willed by God. So uh, it, it, the life in Christ is immediately in front of us every single second of our life it's all there the cross is there the resurrection is there it's all there and 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 tragically we look most of the time somewhere else to find christ somewhere else to find his providence and his love somewhere else to see his presence in our life and it's tragic uh as orthodox christians we really should don't have any excuse i mean we know uh that he is closer to us than to we are to ourselves, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. He's in he's in every cell. The mm-hmm. life of every cell of our body is there because he is life. He is the life of the world. There's nothing that that exists that is not supported and in this by his presence, right? Uh, but I think if we can understand that, go deeper in that mystery, we're gonna immediately start to live deeply. I mean, we, it's right in front of us. It's not far. It's right now. It's in our mind, in our hearts, in our lips. It's on our lips. It's in our, it's in our thoughts. That's where the spiritual life is had and lived. So father, forgive me. I want to, I want to ask you a question, you know, um, and I, I think this is a wonderful thing. I, I think I would like to see more of it because generally what we've seen, you know, at least, you know, you know, my 19 or so years in the church, um, <laughs> It's a lot of evangelicals, Protestants becoming Orthodox, but it seems like the number of people who do not have a Christian background, you know, or at least not a strong one, and they're approaching the church is growing, which I think is yes. wonderful. 
And I think that's the way it should be, you know. Well, Johnson. Um, hmm? Well, Johnson, right? He was well, Johnson. Agnostic. That's right. That's right. So so in light of that. I think he found Cyprian. Didn't he find you, Cyprian? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, he did indeed. He did indeed. He told me that. Well, he 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 found Lester Seraphim Rose is who he found because that's how that's how I gave him the book and then did that he was done he was it and then he found an Orthodox church right in his old, little town in Texas he told me that's that. right that's right yeah. <laughs> isn't that amazing I love that story yeah oh, sorry Father I no no, no it, it, and that's great it's just I mean we've had this conversation before on the show here it's like you know we've been bold and challenging people but you know I stand by I know Cyprian stands by it's like if you really want the truth in Christ he can make it happen. Buck ended up living five minutes from this church. You know, uh, Cyprian's on the island of Sa- Saipan, one of the most remotest islands. And he got baptized, you know. Um, so God is able and willing if we are. But hey, it, Cyprian, if you need if you need anybody to bring you communion, I think Father and I could probably come out for a week or two. <laughs> well, that would be nice. <laughs> we'll never say no to that. We'll yeah, never I was going to say, say no. what are you doing out there for communion? I just thought about that. We we when uh, when priests uh, providentially show up, then we get communion. So and it's happened, which is All right, well, glory to well, God. You know what I mean? But the, but no, Father, this is part of the question about missions. There and you go. As you yes, say he's got to exactly. do. He's got to become a missionary. This you know, all there exactly. is to it. You know, and he, you know they, they're doing typica there every week. You know, so they're so they're growing it. But this this reality of people who are who really and and I don't think I know it's problematic. But I still say Christ is being preached, so let them come. That's my stance on things, you know. Um, but there are people who they really haven't had an encounter with Christ yet. Mm. But they see that the Orthodox Church is holding out on certain levels, or or they saw that, or they it, whatever brings them is fine. But exactly. they got, if they're going to stay, they got to go deep. Exactly. Exactly. That's the difference. So whatever that's what brings I wanted them doesn't to ask matter. You about I wanted to ask you about that in regards of. You know, what are some of the things that you have found have been um, in the context of the kind of the field that we're talking about now? You know, people who really so many people have not been raised. We live in a post-Christian age, truly. I mean, there are there are so many people who have never heard the, the, the Bible stories, the stories of this, you know, in the scripture. They don't know about the prophecy, but they don't know the parables. Right. So on one hand. It's rich with potential because it's fresh ground. They don't have the goofy interpretations that they would have had growing up as evangelicals. But on the other hand, it's almost, I think a lot of people don't have the language to connect with people Mm. because Mm. they've lost sight of what it means to speak with someone who's not in Christ, like truly, you know, a barbarian, quote unquote. And and I think a lot of priests might be intimidated by that. Yeah, I was going to say we need to look at, for instance, how they did mission work in pagan England and Ireland and Scotland back in the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th century, 4th century. We need to look at examples of the early um, uh, missionaries to the world. Or, for instance, Father Cosmas, we published Mm -hmm. a book, Apostles Zaire, The Life and Legacy of Father Cosmas Gregorio, who went to the Congo and other examples, we need those examples because we're facing an uh, a mission to a totally unchristian, uh, unchurched, uh, pagan society. And, and uh, to quote Father Josiah, actually, I'll say we shouldn't even call it a pagan society. It's an insult to the pagans. Mm. Uh, it's ah. worse than paganism. That's right. It's nihilism. It's nihilism. It's meaninglessness. Or it's transhumanist utopianism, which is... Mm satanic you know so it's not it's worse than paganism in in many ways pagans had their religious sentiments they had a reference to a higher being at least they thought they did you know uh so i think that there's a tremendous tremendous work to be done in this realm and i and what i really would like and i say everywhere and i'll say it as long as i can and as loud as i can catechism needs to go deeper longer and needs to end in baptism Mm-hmm. end of story no more discussion that is what the church fathers of our day that's what the church fathers are saying we've got a new book coming out on this topic in a couple of weeks it's going to lay out the whole tradition 450 pages 700 footnotes it's going to lay it out 
And but it's it, it's not just about the mystery of baptism. It's also about the the whole process of purification. Look, catechism is a process of purification. Mm-hmm. It's not learning about Christ. Mm-hmm. That's the very very beginning and a part of catechism. And it's essential that we change our perspective on who God is, of course. But if that's all we're doing, if it's just a head trip, it's a rational mm-hmm. analysis. It's learning about Christ. We're not prepared for baptism. Mm-hmm. It's very clear from the time of the fourth century. You look at Saint Cyril of Jerusalem and how they approach this thing. Three years, and it wasn't an accident. Why it was three years? It was three years because the the apostles sent, spent three years with the Lord, mm-hmm. right? They didn't just choose three years because well, it seems like they need that long. They were imitating the apostles, and they and they and they saw that there needed to be a long process for a variety of reasons. But one of the most important is that it takes time to change the habits. Mm-hmm. It takes time to throw off the old ways, not just what you think, but how you live. Mm-hmm. So if we grew up living narcissistically, egotistically, and we don't make you know big changes in that way of not the not what we say about Christ, but the way we think, the way we live, when we reach the baptismal font, of course, God gives himself totally to us. But we won't have the experience of that. We'll have blockage. We'll have an obstacle to experiencing that grace and manifesting that grace in our life. It's not an accident that you see miraculous things happen to only a certain number of people. We have uh, pictures that we just saw from a parish down in New Mexico we were looking at. In any case, I mean, I don't want to get into that question because there seems to be some controversy about it. But there are there are, there are um, miraculous things that you see at certain bap- baptisms, like a Manathos, the dove. I've seen pictures of a dove over a man's face. You see other people, they they come out of the baptismal font and they're glowing. I mean, you can mm-hmm. see that they're clearly glowing. And people said that about friends of mine on Mount Athos when they, they were baptized. The monks were telling me, look at that man, he's glowing. Now, th- why does God allow that? Well, I think, of course, there's it's it's God's mystery. It's a mystery of God's providence. We don't know ultimately every reason why he allows it. But I think it's also because of the preparation, the internal preparation mm-hmm. of the person who's approaching the mystery and how much they've They've been purified and they've prepared their heart with great longing and love to be united to Christ. Uh, uh, There's, I could tell you a really interesting story online, but I'm not gonna. I don't want to go on a tangent. But there's, there's a lot of things that have led me to this, to this, to this belief. So the process of of initiation is essential, and it's got to go through that. It doesn't have to be three years, but it's got to go through those stages. And and there's going to be in the in the mystagogue, the priest, there's going to be that plutophoria, we say in Greek, that information is going to come, and he's going to say, now you're ready, right? Now you're ready. Now, it might be six months, but probably not. We have so much baggage, mm-hmm. and we've got to be purified of that. And again, it's on a level low, down deep, the level of instinct. Like, I, there's a there's a prayer, I don't remember where, now where it's from. It's, I've been saying it for so many years, I forgot where it's from. But it, it it's, you know... Um, Purify, purify me whom defiled, cleanse me whom stained, humble me whom proud and arrogant, chase me whom slothful and lustful, teach me whom dumb. In my thoughts, words, and deeds, impulses and glances, decisions and desires. I mean, that deeper man has to be purified, right? The impulses, the, the reactions. The, that's where you see if the Holy Spirit is in charge or you're still living according to the old man and the passions. It's not just in the big stuff the big Mm -hmm. desires, the big decisions. It's in the little stuff where you're not prepared, right? The momentary stuff where you're provoked and you're angry. That's where you can say, oh, I'm still a slave to that old passion or whatever. And and then the person has to be trained and to be watchful. He has to be trained how to be prayerful. He has to be trained in the prayer, like to learn the prayer. And he has to get ahead of that, right? He has to get ahead of the temptation. He has to be in a state of watchfulness so that when the temptation comes, He's not caught off guard. All this training that goes on, it's not just after baptism. It's actually meant to be before. So that but, when they I mean, the baptismal font, they get the full. Right. Well, forgive me, Father. I, I, think, I think there's a piece that a lot of people just do not think about, which is definitely you're talking about people don't think about in regards of like preparing to receive fully as fully as possible. Yes. That the vessel would be deep instead of a yes. shallow vessel. But there's another portion of I mean, keeping grace. No one yes, really thinks yes. about keeping grace. And, yes. and that's the thing because God helped me, but that that's where I have had that struggle. And that's where I am focused on now as a spiritual father is that 
my context is, you know, I see people who have the shortcut, which is suffering. And so I, I mean that meaning um, I've, I've known people and I've seen people where their suffering is great and it's real and their longing for Christ is birthed out of that suffering. But the problem has been not their willingness or their need or even uh, they, they know they need Christ. Therapists have failed them. Drugs they've got to shore up. Them. They've got to shore up the vessel, Father. And that's the thing is, they've got to the they've got to plug those holes. That's that is the so thing. when the grace comes in, it doesn't flow out. That means that's the, the habits have to change, the ways, yep. the deep thoughts, yep. the processes have to change. That's exactly it, and, and it's keeping grace. Yes. People don't understand this reality of you need to actually you know, keep the the, grace. the 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 whole patristic literature, the philokali, everything. What are they talking about? Most of the time, they're talking about. The loss or the gaining and the mm-hmm. keeping of grace, mm-hmm. and the and they're mostly talking about like scientists and medicine. What do, what do doctors talk about most of the time? Diseases mm-hmm. or sicknesses, right? That's what they they're not dealing with most of the time. Something else they're dealing with the problem, right? Mm-hmm. So in the in the ascetic literature, they're dealing with what takes us away from grace, the passions and the demons, right? And 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 the various temptations and the machinations of the demons, right? We've got to go deeper in that whole science of the spiritual life. If we're going to go, we're going to shine forth the grace. The grace is going to shine forth rather through us. And therefore, go back to our original topic, we're actually become light to the nations, missionaries to people around us, right? As long as we're more moralistic, legalistic Christians, Orthodox Christians, people will still come to the church in spite of us, but not nearly what the Lord could do with us and not nearly the depth that we could take them. Right. Right. You know, in spite of us, people are coming in spite of what the lack of mission, the, the philatism and the ecumenism and all that. You still see people flocking to the church because in spite of us, Christ still, of course, is working among the people to bring them to the truth. But how much more he could do if the, if the donkey, you know, <laughs> would just listen and he could speak through a couple of us. How much more? Look what he did with one little guy, one little man, with one little prayer rope from Mount Athos. Look what he did. Amen. Incredible. I mean, I feel so sorry for those people who didn't didn't want or didn't understand who Elder Ephraim was while he was on this earth and rejected him. And even now, some of them don't understand and reject him. I feel so sorry because the Lord sent an apostle to this, this, this wayward land and you know, he was this little, extremely humble human being who God worked through. And, you know, we missed it. We, a lot of us missed the boat, you know, he had tremendous temptations from everybody <laughs> above and below him. Uh, and but well, that's the way God, you know, made him even holier. But uh, we have, uh, we, we, we need to look around us and go and take opportunities, you know, go deep, go deep and don't, don't waste our time. It's a very Amen. short time. Amen. Very short time. Amen. Very so, short time. Um, I think we are coming up on two hours and that's usually when we cut it off. It doesn't have to be, but I thought that maybe that, you know, this would be an okay time because, uh, you had mentioned, um, Father Peter, that you had talked about um, apostles, and actually, I would read this quote if I could by Saint John Chrysostom, put out by the wonderful Orthodox Ethos just today, mm-hmm. um, where Saint John Chrysostom is speaking and uh, says, "For if Jesus did not rise again but remains dead, how did the apostles perform miracles in His name? But you say that, uh, but you say that they did not perform miracles." Then how is our religion founded? For this would be the greatest of miracles is without that without any miracles, the whole world should have eagerly come to be taken in the nets of twelve poor and illiterate men. So awesome. And, yeah. He just <laughs> oh, the mic wow. he's the mic dropper. He's the man. Wow. Yeah, mic yeah, like, mic yeah, like <laughs> it's like saying to these rationalists, like, no matter how you spin it, folks, you can't answer. You don't have an answer for what happened. It's yeah. great. Yeah. That is a good one. That is so fantastic. I had a closing question. Speaking of people who inspire, saints who inspire, especially as Father Peter was talking about earlier, um, is there, I kind of wanted to ask the uh, the three of you, and then I would include my answer as well, is there any particular saint right now that seems to be really working on you? Like um, there's a particular saint that's really, really 
inspiring you right now for me it has been for the past year year and a half is saint papa nicholas like i've been re i'm rereading the his life right now and just his planas planas mm -hmm. yes 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 yes. Planas. Yes. Uh -huh. yes uh yes uh so uh saint nicholas uh planas yeah he mm -hmm. um his humility his absolute dedication there was this uh in his life, there was this, uh, I'll tell two stories really quick. There was one where he had served an all night vigil with these priests and they're all kind of scoffing at him because he's just a little old man, kind of like dirty and tattered vestments. And um, they're kind of making fun of him a little bit behind the altar and stuff like that. And when he walked out, all these, you know, um, maybe I'm using this term incorrectly, all these yayas, like all these old, mm -hmm. like elderly Greek women, all like fell down at his feet and started kissing his vestments and stuff like that. And all these priests all were like, oh, no, what did we do? We were making fun of him the entire time. And then they end the story with he walked to a church and then began the liturgy. Like that's how he began the liturgy the next day. And then the um, second one that I love, love this story um, but he was at his church and one of the gardeners there did not like him. And she made some obscene gesture at him behind his back or something like that. And that night she is visited by St. John, the forerunner who, basically, who slapped her across the face. And when she woke up, had still had the mark on her face. And he basically said, go apologize, go apologize to him. And she did. And he was like, oh, it's no, don't worry about it. Don't. But yeah, St. John, the forerunner had his back. And then there's the. Well, uh, St. James showed up in a dream. And he's like, yeah, St. Nicholas sent me. St. Nicholas Planas sent me. So um, he's he's somebody that I just continue to come back to right now. So He's kind of a Kolivadi's father. And uh, I don't know if you know that that it, there's an icon of the Kolivadi's fathers who are, who are usually identified just of a few monks on Athos in the, ninth, in the 18th century. But in Greek tradition... Uh, it's much more extensive. So they've included St. Nectarios, mm -hmm. Saint Papa Nicholas Planas, Papul, uh, Papulakos, who just was, uh, they just decided to, to glorify him. Papulakos is another Greek missionary, St. Cosmas et Los. Basically, from the last half of the 18th century until the middle of the 19th century, uh, 20th century, there's a whole group of saints who have basically, the, they're the modern hesychist missionary uh confessors of the faith and there's a huge icon and uh so to answer your question that's who i've been uh spending a lot of time with lately are the colivadis fathers saint nectar saint nicodemus the athenite of course we have uh, three books we published by saint nicodemus translated father george dokos and then uh saint paisus velichkovsky famous mm -hmm. i mean phenomenal and mm -hmm. important saint um but also, St. Athanasius of Paros, who's a great uh, saint who's unknown to the vast majority of people. We're mm -hmm. going to translate, God willing, three of his works on the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, which are very necessary even today. Uh, and, the, and then there's just a whole host of um, uh, of, of saints in their wake uh, that are unknown to most of us. So our, our goal with our press is to increasingly translate and publish the works of the Kolivadis Fathers. Uh, including Saint Athanasius and um, and others who aren't even saints. Like there's a, a very important writer in the time of Saint Nicodemus. His name was Dorotheus Vulismas, and he wrote a very important treatise on baptism. And that's one of our publications that we hope to be translating and publishing. But all the way up into the 20th century, really, that 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 is the core of Orthodox tradition in Orthodox Greece and in the Greek speaking world is. Uh, all of these monastic ascetic figures on Athos. Uh, and uh, it's hard to underestimate and the role and the importance of Athos in the Orthodox Church really for the last millennium. And and these are the last 250 years. These are the saints that have really shown forth, you know, right up to St. Paisos, Porfirios, Jacobos, and, and, uh, and Joseph the Hesychist. Uh, so I, it's hard for me to say one saint, but so, but that's what I've been dealing with lately. I don't know. Uh, what, what about you, Father uh, Turbo? Uh, I've been I've been having actually an interesting phenomenon, and I'm hoping that me acknowledging my weakness, uh, I'll get some grace from it. But um, I've had this phenomena with with two saints. This these interactions, um, 
St. Jacobos of Evia and um, St. Ephraim. Um, and both of them, I had this encounter where the best way for me to describe it is they'd been, they'd been knocking on my door and I hadn't been really paying attention mm. like, I, like I knew I, I should have. Mm. Um, and then they began to start knocking like really loud, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in, in certain ways where, you know, okay, it's all right, you got my attention. And then just opening those doors um, have been incredible. You know, St. Yagavos, I mean, he was, you know, all but coming to me. And then one day there was, there was a series of interactions I had had with a couple of the nuns and then a couple people, some brothers, and it, it was one situation in particular just opened my eyes and I was like, wow. And so I had had, you know, um, uh, that wonderful work on him, um, drink the garden, uh, garden of the Holy spirit. Mm -hmm. And it just had been sitting there. I'd been looking at it, you know, I, I'm one of those people I sit, you know, waist deep in books. I'm reading books, books, books. And then, you know, this one I've been seeing, and then it was just so obvious. And then as soon as I started cracking it and, and starting to, you know, forgive the expression, but commune with him and really get to know him. It was like, God, forgive me. St. Yakovos, pray for me. You know, it was, it was really humbling. And we've with, got a book. We're, we're publishing a book in about a month on his life. Oh, really? He's, he's, it's just another uh, disciple that had, had written about him. So it's, he's, another... he's incredible. He's incredible. I mean, even to the point where the kids at our school, we're bringing him up, you know, completely separate. It's like, okay, I got to start listening. And then St. Ephraim, uh, the new, that he's, he's been, he's been knocking my door. And um, so those two, those two. When you say St. Ephraim, the new, you mean the new martyr of Nea Macri or you mean yes. other Ephraim in America? Yes. The new Nea martyr. Macri. Yes. Uh -huh. Nea Macri, yes. Although, you know, my, my love for Yoranda Ephraim, who is a saint, it is it, it, it's continuously growing um saint anthony's let me give a little shout out there saint anthony's monastery has you know there's um someone's god bless their work of doing the audiobooks and they've you know done and i know for a lot of people it's a struggle and you we know should include that in the notes so, sorry father we should include yeah, that link in the notes it's, That's it's incredible a, credible ministry it's a big help and, and you know, i've thrown it out to people in the parish and i mean being able to let Saint you're on the Ephraim is just incredible. The the, the this book the, on sickness and suffering. Oh, it's just like next level. It's next, next level. level. It's absolutely incredible. Next level. came at a really good time too. Amen. Amen. A book on sickness and suffering. What's the title? It's a chapter. Chapter. It's oh. from his. It's from his uh, his works. It's, okay. you know, Father, the one with the shepherd. It's got the shepherd on the... Oh, the, the, you're talking about the path to salvation. Path to salvation, yeah. It's from... Yes, yes. It's a chapter. Yeah. It's incredible. It's a chapter, and it's just like this... It's about 45 minutes worth of audio, and it's just like... It came at a really, really good time. It mm. was it was definitely sent to me, mm. like, without a doubt. And it was, um, it was the first time I had heard it in such plain speak of when we see what God is able to do with our suffering in heaven, we will wish we had suffered more. We'll yeah. wish that like more things, more bad things had happened to us. And I, yeah, when he says, he, when he says the patriarch Abraham would, you know, would wish that he could have suffered more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. It's what about that's you? What Saint, that's what St. Ephemia said to St. Paisios. If you've read yes. the life of St. Paisios, he said, she said the same thing. That's right. That's right. Really interesting. And I just you know, got another, another, another bring it me. I just want to say this one last one because I've, I've come back around to, and everyone knows, everyone who's watched, everyone knows my my deep, deep love and veneration for St. Sophroni. But man, I, I've, I've come back around and it's it's like all new again. I just, he, he's been very, very, very humbling. Very humbling to just kind of sit with him again. So anyways, I just wanted to throw that out there because it's, I'm the one who asked two priests about what saints they like. So I, you know, <laughs> I'm honestly surprised we kept this to a tight 10 minutes. So Cyprian, what about you? <laughs> I I had the wildest experience with um, St. Gabriel of Georgia over mm. the course of like the last, well, it, it was a month basically like with 
Posca right in between because the two brothers who are here who actually their first experience of orthodoxy was two years ago, father coming here doing services and they were moved and then a series of things happened and they became catechumens. And so they were heading out to Hawaii to be baptized. So they're baptized now um, after, after, you know, uh, their, their time as catechumens. And as they were leaving, one of them said, uh, here we have this icon of St. Gabriel of Georgia that we have in the house. And also we happen to ha have some gravel from his grave. Mm. And so uh, I think that he said, I think this icon wants to stay here with you, not in our house. Like it wants to stay with you. And I said, OK, so we have our area set up where we do Tipica and it's it's like a prayer corner plus, you could say. And so we have all of our icons there and everything. And so. St. Gabriel was over with some other icons and with, with it there. And something happened a few days into, you know, that's where I go to do my morning and evening prayers and we do Tipica. And if I'm going to say the hours, the this, whatever. And something happened a few days into it being there where I was like, I just got this very strong feeling like St. Gabriel does not want to be over there. Like he wants to be like praying. He wants to be over here. And it was the weirdest thing and this continued the whole entire time. And I was just, and I can't explain, I can't explain this. I don't, but it was so palpable. It was so strong that I was, and when they came back, <laughs> I gave them the icon. <laughs> I gave them the icon and I said, yo, there's something with that icon. And they both started laughing as they got back in the car, as I picked them up from the airport. I was like, yo, what's up with this icon? And they both started laughing. And they were like, it's crazy, right? And then they took it back. So this was a very weird and a very weird situation that happened. But it was it was palpable. And um and yeah, I had I had I mean, we had even discussed him and he wasn't even somebody yeah. who's on my radar, but he's a I guess he's a big deal for me now. So Yeah. He's, he's a big deal. Um, he's, he's a big deal, that's for sure. He's a great he's, saint. Absolutely he's the the only social media I have is Tumblr and he, his him burning the Lenin, the picture of Lenin is Which my was huge, by the way. Yeah. It, I mean, it was a huge, huge picture. Of Lenin. <laughs> so like, it would have been, it would have been quite a sight. Yeah. yeah. A sight. He's absolute. I have a special fondness for the fools. I think the fools are, are, I will never be a fool, but I think that they, embody something that i think is so incredibly important to me it has been my entire it's just mm -hmm. to just never take yourself too seriously it's just never it but like in a stern way not in like a not in a silly not in a silly like don't make a fool of your like not oh don't make forgive me don't make an ass of yourself mm -hmm. like but be a fool you know like it's okay like um Oh, oh, Saint, uh, Father, he's your Slava Saint. Uh, Saint, uh, oh, Saint Theophil. Yeah. When he would just, the key of caves. Yeah. He'd just get in the cart and just start praying, and the donkey would just take him from place to place. Yeah. Like, just absolutely incredible. Just like, and he'd just sit there and just read the Psalms, and the donkey would just take him. Like, that is like, that's exactly, that is exactly who and I they're, am. They're great because they really shake you out of this kind of like moralism niceness, you know, that like, oh, niceness my is is the you know evidence of sanctity and it's quite the opposite i mean that old soul song smiling faces you know it's not about the smiling faces you know that, that's that's one of the great things i love about the 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 Euro Divi, the, those those holy fools is that they really call us to task on you know the polite society and how it can actually be the the, the detriment to to true love and sanctity i and I think that was something that had called me even before I was Orthodox was I was looking around and seeing the da 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 da, da of like polite society. And like, mm -hmm. I think so many people realize at, at on an emotional level, like the soul killing aspect of that, that just how like deadening that can be. Mm -hmm. And to bring it truly full circle, I continue as even as I grow in Christ, uh, the the amount that I do is how well that is portrayed on the island. You know, when he just um, in the movie, The Island, when he comes out with that first woman who's seeking a blessing for an abortion mm. and he's silly, but he's like, oh, you're going to hell and you want to take me with you, huh? Like that is like perfect, like absolutely like silly, but stern, but like very like hmm, right there. So 
Anyway, okay. I just saw I just saw a, 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 a serious like meme from some kind of Protestant. Some Orthodox was sharing it, and he was seriously saying, "A nice Muslim is a better Christian than a mean Christian." Oh. And so this is the this is the future of the world. The Antichrist will be very kind in the beginning. He'll be very impressive. Mm. He'll have lots of virtues. So you know, if this is what if this is what you think it means to be a Christian, which is unfortunately a lot of apparently a lot of Christians think the most important thing is to have be a agreeable. superficial yeah. politeness. God help us. Yeah, be agreeable. Forgive me, Father. I, I just want to say this because I, I just feel it's really important. And I think that's an aspect more, I don't know if there's ever been a time, but in regards of catechesis and teaching people the the voice of the, the real voice of the real shepherd and teaching people to disregard superficiality. And that's the thing about, it's an almost a different type of asceticism of not looking for the sweet saccharin. Because if you're looking for the sweet saccharin, you'll not only will you miss the, the master's voice, but in some regards, you will have a, um, a disregard for it. You know, mm. it's, it's people not even realizing that what they're rejecting is him. You know, the the discipline and, and the call to repentance, the call the call to change, the the sting, the burn of his presence. You know, I mean, and, he he turned and said to Peter, "Get behind me, Satan!" Mm-hmm. He threw over the tables in the in the in the uh, temple. Mm-hmm. He said, "Woe and woe unto the Pharisees." Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, this is the same Lord that is love incarnate. Yes. yes. Right? Yeah. Not that these are things that we can all imitate because we might be impoverished spiritually. We have to be careful, not act like we have some kind of righteousness. But I'm just saying th- this is the image of the loving God. It's not It's not a superficial politeness by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, I've said it before and I'll say it a couple more times probably, but Father Stephen DeYoung has a podcast the uh, um council of wisdom i think full council it. full council of truth yeah. I think. yeah something like that full council goes, of god full council of god yeah. yeah seems like we should have known that quicker but that's okay um he <laughs> basically talks about like uh he talks about uh there's the scripture where christ is rebuking i think the pharisees and he says listen to how on christ like christ is being right <laughs> and i was just like that is yeah. exactly exactly what it is so yeah. Father, Peter, it was an honor to have you on. Thank you very, very you. much Thank for you coming for on. You Thank much. you. It was a joy. I love I, talking to you. I'm I glad am. to meet all of you. And I have to say that I have been, uh, even I think before I knew much about Father Turbo, I think I knew about Cyprian, actually, believe it or not. I think Cyprian, somehow we connected on Twitter at some point or something I was going so, on. I think so, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, Back in the time when I was on Twitter, I've given it up now, Father. <laughs> oh, have you given it up? Okay, yeah, I don't I'm see it anymore it over there. Yeah, yeah, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I'm, I'm not really I'm not really on social media, but Orthodox Ethos is all over the place. Of but, course. <laughs> you know, we drop in and see what's happening once in a while. But anyway, uh, it was a joy to meet all of you in, in person, and I, hopefully uh, we can uh, actually see you in the flesh someday and thank you so much for your thank you your work and your ministry and i, I hope that this has been a helpful to your listeners may be blessed may yeah. be blessed. thank you father. thank you father i i'm gonna forego the usual plugs that we do at the end of the show other than we have our new email you can contact us at it is contact at royalpath.network please send your emails and your questions there unless you want to reach out to me personally andrew at royalpath.network I'm not going to do the disservice of plugging Father Peter Here's His Stuff. If you guys are here, you probably know who he is and what he does. And it'll all be in the description. We'll and it'll it all, all be in the description. And please go and visit. Please go. Yeah, the Orthodox Ethos. The Orthodox Ethos. They, Uncut um, Mountain Press also. Some if you great, are, incredible works. If you are thinking of getting off YouTube shorts, like I often am, just remember Orthodox Ethos puts out these amazing <laughs> quotes. I screenshot every single one of them because yeah, they are tasty all, ones always right? little wonderful nuggets to help me get through the day. So thank you very much and thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye. I mean <laughs>